Hello and welcome from PTC's World Headquarters in Boston. My name is Alex Daly and I am the Senior Director of Federal Aerospace and Defense here at PTC. My colleague, Danny Poisson, is also joining us today. Danny is the Chief Technology Officer of our Federal Aerospace and Defense business globally. He has a wide background across shipbuilding, missile defense, and sensor capabilities. Welcome, Danny. It's good to see you. Hey, thank you very much, Alex. Glad, glad to be here. So perhaps for those of you who are unaware of PTC, we are an industrial software firm with about 30,000 active customers across multiple industries. Globally, PTC does about $2 billion in revenue per year. And what we're trying to do as a company is create a new generation of digital technology that offers transformational unlocks in the way our customers engineer, manufacture, and service physical products. The companies that make products that the world relies on rely on PTC. And in many ways, our Fed sector and aerospace and defense business embodies this idea. If you're a defense contractor, that might mean lowering R&D costs within a firm fixed price contract, accelerating product development, or taking down record backlogs. If you're a government stakeholder, that could mean faster IOC of a new platform or increasing operational readiness of already fielded assets. Our main customers in this business are the DOD, Department of Energy, and NASA, along with many of the major defense contractors in the U.S. and globally. And this all helps us to level set as to why we're all here today. With the recent release of Department of Defense Instruction 5097, the DOD has taken a bold step in requiring digital engineering technology for new acquisition programs. Bottom line, for any program starting in calendar year 2024, DOD program managers are now required to implement digital engineering procedures as early in program planning as possible and across the system lifecycle. The instruction mentions MBSE, CAD, and PLM as digital methods in support of program activities. In the DOD and in the defense industrial base, digital engineering capabilities from PTC will be critical to accelerating this vision into reality. It also defines specific capability elements in order to get there, and we'll go into more detail on those in just a moment. While programs that were started before December 2023 aren't required to implement digital engineering, many of them already are as a best practice. We see this trend accelerating with the new instruction. Also, the DOD tends to set the pace for this type of policy adoption, so NASA, Department of Energy, and other agencies are likely watching it very closely. Finally, we know this is the direction the DOD is now headed in. So whether the program you may be bidding on uses digital engineering or not, having a meaningful and sharp point of view in this area could be a win theme onto itself. Danny and I are going to chat for a bit, walk through some of the material that we've prepared, and then we'll save the remaining time for questions and answers. If you do have a question or comment, please do drop that in the chat. Total time should be a little bit over an hour. So Danny initial reactions to this remarkable policy? Well, the, the timing was interesting, Alex. Um, sure. Just, you know, again, right around the holidays, just for the holidays. Uh, I think at this point, you and I were both off for the holidays. I'm not even sure what possessed me. Did a Google search, just trying to see, <laughs> just keeping myself up to speed on what was going on right. in the DOD area. Um, happened to stumble across this. Like, okay, hang on, let, let, me, let me read this, yeah. right? Because this is different. This was, I, w I was expecting the strategy document yeah. was sort of the top of mind. When I found this, I said, okay, hey, let's dig into this. And I think I immediately contacted you and said, hey, yeah. have you seen this yet, right? Yeah. I thought I was late to the, to the, to the party. With the Absolutely. Tournament. No. I mean, I, I, I had kind of one eye on it. Um, it was uh, very just glanced across my desk. And, and again, I, I think I was in holiday mode at the time. And then when I did have time to give it the attention it truly deserved, it was a remarkable moment. And I've been th through it backwards and forwards about 37 times, as I'm sure you have. <laughs> Absolutely. I, actually, you know, the timing may have seemed interesting and, you know, people are off on the holiday, but it actually gave me time to actually focus on it, to your point, to read it. Right. I think I read it maybe four or five times within the first couple of days, just making sure I understood, what, am I dreaming this, right? Yeah. Because you know, are we actually going from strategy to policy? Mm -hmm. and, and sure enough, we're going to policy, right? So if we think about, you know, if we think about the background on this particular, um, you know, instruction from the DOD, right. it does state it is a policy, right? Which is important to understand, right? Yeah. It is no longer going from, you know, recommendations, those types of things, it's policy. It actually assigns responsibilities, right, to folks in the DOD on mm -hmm. exactly what needs to be done and actually outlines a process procedure 
for how it should be taken care of. Right. You mentioned it, uh, you know, in your intro around new program starts. Um, people are wondering, you know, when does this, you know, who's impacted by this? I've got a pro, you know, I've got a program that's underway. Am I, you know, do I have implications here? Right. Uh, you pointed out clearly, right? New program starts after the instruction. Mandatory for them to, you know, to address digital engineering mm -hmm. uh, as early in the acquisition process as possible. Yeah. However, those that are in process today. If digital engineering is good and it suits that program, become makes it more efficient, mm -hmm. brings down risk. Yes, embrace digital engineering. I think this this is what the the policy and what the Under Secretary of Defense Heidi Shu's intentions are at this point. Right. With regards to, well, what types of programs are actually, uh, you know, impacted by this? Well, there's six, you know, acquisition programs that are that are called out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, major acquisition programs, ACAT one, for example, mid tier, ACAT right. two, right. software. Uh, even talks about uh, getting systems for business, right? For business operations within the DoD mm -hmm. should go through this process as well. Software. Um, but what's really important is actually any emerging needs. So like we're seeing, uh, you know, globally today, there's so many things happening globally. Mm -hmm. Specifically, think about Ukraine, for example, right? What are the emerging needs that are happening there? What are the emerging needs that we have our own soil or other places that we're forward deployed and making sure that uh, our warfighters have the right solutions at hands? How about yourself? What, what well, do you think about this? Well, so the other thing I've been thinking a lot about is just the continuing resolution. I mean, we're about to cross the midway point of FY24 without a budgetary deal done between Congress and the president for defense appropes. And um, that leaves us, you know, in a, in a state of a CR. Obviously, within a continuing resolution, there are no new program starts by definition. So programs that normally would have perhaps started after October the 1st, 2023 and gotten off in, in earnest, um, they are just not, not happening. There's almost a parking lot of programs that, that, are, um, that are not happening at, at the moment. And when they, they are finally activated with a budgetary deal, this new policy will be applicable to them. That's a very important point because there's a, almost a log jam of them happening right now. And that will be broken the second the president's uh, signature is affixed to a defense appropriations deal. That's the first thing. The second thing is just the way uh, contract deliverables are going to be sent to Department of Defense customers. They're, they're saying no more documents. We want this to happen electronically, whether it's a CDRL or a DID or, uh, or other types of, of documentation. That's all going to be electronic from this point forward. Um, again, many programs have already embraced digital engineering, so we see this as more of, a, you know, a positive tailwind for a trend that was already in flight. Um, and it's not just the DoD PMs who are going to need to have access to digital engineering. I, I think there's, uh, we may be uh, correct, maybe maybe incorrect in this assumption, but it seems as if executive leadership in the Pentagon is saying, "Hey, I want a window into your digital engineering worldview." If you're running a ground vehicle program in Michigan, if you're running a strategic systems program, if you're um, you know, running a, a submarine program, for example, we want to have a window in. Um, and that provides a much more, I think, a department level strategic viewpoint into a program. You think about things like chipset vulnerability mm -hmm. uh, globally and what that, uh, what that can mean and just the strategic implications for the DOD. I think it's interesting that you talk about, you know, not just the PMs, right? There's uh, there's very strong language. I, I call it strong collaboration. We're here in collaboration all the time. Uh, and it's, it's throughout the document, mm -hmm. right? This instruction, which I think is uh, important. It's an important aspect that they're hitting home on. You mentioned seizures, right? So I was wondering when I, was, when I first read the document, mm -hmm. right? Understood, say, okay, they're saying you should go do this and that, but what are they expecting on deliverables? It was actually really happy to see that they actually called out in Cedrals, right? Yeah. That there would be deliverables and deliverables of models, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's an important uh, shifting point here for the DOD. Right, absolutely. And then the next piece to all of this was we were wondering, would the intelligence community perhaps be subject to part of this? Well, of course, the intelligence component of all of the respective services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Space Force, certainly will, but also think about the Defense Intelligence Agency, um, the NRO, the National Security Agency, the National Geospatial Intel Intelligence Agency. Um, you know, legally speaking, they're all subject to Department of Defense regulations as well, including this one. So the policy would be applicable to them. 
I think it's a great point you bring up because I think when we talk about policies and we think about the you know the major primes right in dealing with the, the government and actually working on programs, we don't often hear about the intelligence community, mm -hmm. uh, community right. So it's glad you actually clarified that this is also applicable to uh, to that community as well. True. All right. So maybe some historical perspective you can set for us. Yeah, I mentioned this. You know, as you. Uh, kind of introduced me and brought me into the conversation here. Um, as I you mentioned, it's like you know, 30 years in the making, right? Back to 1994 when we first saw the first sort of DOD instruction around modeling and simulation, right? So it's gone through evolutions in 2007, right? As, as we know it would, mm -hmm. as we learned more and technology got better, uh, had another revision in 2018. At the same time, the DOD put out its you know, digital engineering uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. Then there was a modernization strategy that came after that. Then from there, we saw that each of the branches uh, you know, of, the, of the DOD putting out their own respective sort of strategies, if you will. And that kind of brings us to, to today. Um, we should note that you know, today's new policy actually uh, incorporates and cancels that prior. Um, the 2007 instruction. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I went back and read that one too. And it was interesting that I actually had not even had a reference to digital engineering. So clearly it was, it was quite out of date uh, by the time we land at today, which is really where we are in the macro environment of 2024. Um, on, on the one hand, you have to think about research and development costs and the tax landscape has changed significantly, even in the last two or three years. And um, you know, it used to be that you could write off research and development expenditures within a 12-month time frame. Well, now it's five years, and that by default is a substantial tax increase. Greg Hayes, for example, at RTX has been highly vocal on this particular topic, and so we see many of our customers um, potentially looking for value unlocks uh, wherever they can find them on the R&D cycle, and one of those may very well be in enterprise systems. So that's the first piece to all of this. The second piece is what's increasingly being referred to as affordable mass and trying to counter an enemy that might have more personnel than you, might even have more fielded assets, including a surface fleet that's larger than yours. But how can you counter that type of capability with your own smart unmanned systems capability? And that's really what gave birth and rise to this idea of Project Replicator that's gotten so much press mm -hmm. in the last six or so months. And, and you know, we think for, for us, all of the potential PTC remedies to some of this, um, which we're framing in, in the blue boxes down here, could be things like bomb, bomb integration. You know, if you're trying to deploy thousands of unmanned systems in the Pacific in the next, I don't know, 18 months or two years, that's not going to be a clean sheet design. You know, those are designs that have already been created. It's really a question now of how do I scale manufacturing and then deliver in as smart a way as possible. And we see that really as a story around bomb integration. And you can use some of the types of tools we bring to the table in order to do that. Yeah, I think the, the affordable mass is, is an interesting point, right? So we just heard, a, I guess, a kind of a fact the other day that I hadn't really thought of, right? I hadn't had at the moment, but mm -hmm. you're hearing that there's 10,000 drones per month, right? True. That are yeah. tradable right now that are in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. in Ukraine war. So that's the type of mass, that's the type of capabilities and the ability to actually produce what is needed, right, to, uh, to, to help the, the folks out there. Right. Right, absolutely. Well, the other thing that we're seeing, especially in overseas markets, are very large, ambitious programs that are crossing national borders. And we have seen, seen some of that with the U.S. and allied nations in, the Euro, in Europe and middle, the Middle East, excuse me. Um, but one example might be the Japanese and the British combining to create a next generation, sixth generation fighter. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is an enormously ambitious program, and they're going to need some kind of an integrated digital environment in order to do that. Yeah, it kind of goes back to, again, some of the things we read, again, in the policy around collaboration, right? So this, this collaboration and data rights protection is a, an important piece to, you know, for some of those things when you're getting multiple countries involved and actually coming up with these next generation types of, of systems, it absolutely is a necessity to be able to do that. And we have several uh, customers, particularly in the U.S. market, who have been using our capabilities for an integrated digital environment or what we're now calling a collaborative work environment for years. And I do see that trend accelerating as many of these global programs pick up. So the other thing that we're thinking a lot about are the combatant commands, not just the acquisition commands. And I think increasingly they are going to be looking for a digital engineering uh, capability, either for sustainment functions or for warfighting functions in theater. 
And you know, you think about uh, Indo-PACOM or uh, CENTCOM as uh, as a couple examples, but there's nine others. Um, you know, I do think that that's going to be a big a big part of of all of this is just extending the digital thread out there. How do I roll out a software update faster than my adversary? This is going to be a key fundamental question to a lot of that, and that actually brings us to many of the venture funded defense technology startups. There's a number of different words you could, could use to describe this this burgeoning crop of uh, of companies. You know, $100 billion in the last three or four years that have gone to remarkable technology, especially for unmanned capability, um, that was really born in the crucible of the battle space itself. And all these companies, whether they're delivering software or they're delivering a weapon system, um, they generally consider themselves to be software first. One example might be Andrel Industries. Palmer Luckey uh, famously has said, you know, a lot of people think that uh, the company is a hardware company. They're truly a software first company. We've seen this trend happening in other industries. We certainly saw it in automotive. And now this is just the sort of aerospace and defense iteration of that trend. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you go back and go back to the, you know, the COCOMs, as you mentioned before, right? That's where the innovation is needed. It's, it's needed in the field, right? right? Things are happening. People need to react. Solutions need to change. As you mentioned before, the software may have to update or maybe there's some, you know, quick change uh, in hardware that has to happen, right? Uh, something that's actually going to get printed in the field that is needed, right? So, sure. you know, through additive manufacturing. Um, so, yeah, I think those are key points that we, we think about. How do we support the, those folks? Right, so that's one important distinction we wanted to make between DOD acquisition and the actual combatant commands on the far right here. Just to kind of level set on some of the market dynamics, first of all, the DOD has been stressing uh, for quite some time, they want industry to self-fund their own R&D as much as possible. That is the demand signal that's being sent clearly by the Pentagon. And when they do contract with them, they want to contract on a firm fixed price basis, not on a cost plus basis. Increasingly, we're also seeing many DOD customers, and this is quite recent, um, that are demanding to serve as the systems integrator of their own very large acquisition program. We're seeing this in the Navy and um, one or two at MDA as well. And when they do, they are oftentimes citing modular open systems approaches or weapons open systems approaches, not closed systems. And again, that is another uh, component to, uh, to all of this. Digital engineering, of course, which is why we're all here today, is, uh, is another theme that we're seeing. So that's the first kind of category. The second category is the big five defense contractors. Um, right now, if you look at the, we just came through earnings season for Lockheed Martin Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, Boeing. Um, if you really look at, at all of them, what are the backlogs? The average backlog for one of the big five firms is about $91 billion. I mean, that's almost, Staggering. it's a record. Yeah. And if you combine all of those big five backlogs, just in the big five, that's about $456 billion, so a, a half a trillion dollars. Again, another, uh, another record clearly. If you combine that with the commercial backlog, most of which of course is going to be coming from Boeing's commercial business, that takes the number to over 1.1 trillion just for the big five. If we actually tie the, an earlier point you made around the continuing resolution in the log jam that's currently set Right. to, un, I guess, unlock, if you will, yeah. with new program starts. Got to think that there's going to be a lot of call for efficiency here um, to be able to, whether it's in engineering or manufacturing, right, to be able to get through these backlogs. Mm -hmm. So you get, you know, 1.1, you know, sort of trillion, if you will, mm -hmm. in current backlog, plus you're going to add to it. Uh, clearly, there's going to be, you know, some, some things that are going to need to be done differently uh, right. in engineering and in manufacturing to support that. Well, that's the upside uh, piece to the whole equation, I think, is, is the record backlogs. The question is, how do I burn the backlog down at a rate I can live with? Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at the operating margins of many of these firms, it's a very uncertain time right now. It's, it's um, a, a very challenging time, uh, particularly because we are operating in a fixed firm fixed price environment and not a cost plus environment. So there's kind of twin forces happening where research and development is much more expensive than it used to be, right? And the way that we are contracting on a firm fixed price basis is depletive to our margins. And, um, you know, if, if you look at the big five from, say, two, three, four years ago, they were about two percentage points higher in operating margin. And so that clearly is a headwind. And I do think that there's going to be a search for efficiency gains and value unlocks. 
And then the, the third element to all of this is this new crop of emerging uh, technology firms. So you think about um, Anduril Industries, Shield AI, Rebellion uh, Defense, Epirus, and on and on and on. There's about 20 of them that are uh, achieving relatively high profile at this point. There's been $100 billion invested in these firms in the last three or four years. And of the $411 billion that was awarded by the DOD last year to all contractors, including the small firms, less than 1% of that went to these firms. But if you think about that, that's just about $4 billion. You know, that's a pretty substantial amount. And it's quite an accomplishment, um, you know, just given the legacy um, of, uh, uh, of all of the, you know, history that has been there in, uh, in all of DOD, DOD contracting. And I do see that type of, you know, impulse toward attritable systems as opposed to exquisite systems increasing. It's never going to be one or the other. We're always going to be existing somewhere on the spectrum between the two. But I do see the DOD embracing um, much more, you know, nimble acquisition approaches, at, at, at least to, you know, to the extent that uh, the lessons learned from all the, uh, all the issues that have been happening in Ukraine, for example, FARA being canceled two weeks ago is a perfect example of that. Absolutely. I think we maybe just take a second and just kind of think about what, what you just came through here, right? Mm -hmm. So when we think about the, the new, the new startups, if we will, right? The, mm -hmm. the folks that are really heavily investing in, in tech, new technology, right? Yeah. I would imagine they're going to become partners, right? Or try to do partnerships with some of the big primes, right? Because they're going to be able to bring in capabilities, right? Sure. Those new capabilities, because they're investing heavily in there at this, this point. If we bring that back to kind of the current backlog and you look, go back to the DOD acquisition, and if you, if you just forget about the policy at the moment, yeah. The need for digital engineering, right, has been clear. The market dynamics have been showing this for a number of years, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, um, it's interesting that the policy has come out. I'm glad it has because I think it's going to, you know, sort of codify and, and solidify. Folks actually go take action and move forward right. with their implementation plans. It's a tailwind to a trend that was already in place. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, well, the other trend that we're seeing, again, is with the combatant commands themselves being much more assertive and, and aggressive in acquiring their own uh, capabilities in order to put that in theater immediately where where it is needed. And so it, it just seems to be like a, a spotlight on three uh, parts of the department that perhaps uh, didn't have as much attention before. The combatant commands are really getting the attention of high technology firms. The office of the chief digital AI officer in the Pentagon is rising. Um, I would say substantially, as well as the chief technology officer of the Pentagon who had issued this policy, Ms. Heidi Hsu. So, yeah, it's, it, it's just a remarkable uh, dynamic uh, environment right now. And, and uh, I do think digital engineering is, is going to be at the center of it. Absolutely. You mentioned it before, software. Um, we, we show here Indopaycom as a particular area. If we just kind of pull the thread on software for a few minutes. You know, the software updates that are needed in the field, we, we see that this is happening very regularly, maybe it's right. daily, maybe it's multiple times a day, right? Uh, in the Ukraine war where, you know, there's there's jamming techniques and trying to get through, uh, you know, for guidance and stuff like that. Um, so having the ability to actually do like an over the air update or actually have software updated on the field when it's needed, where it's needed, yeah. you know, at the speed of battle, mm -hmm. it's absolutely critical. Now that we, we know that that's needed, but what's what digital engineering brings to the front is actually the traceability back to requirements, making sure things are tested, make sure that we have good test results and we understand that software update is going to work for the purpose that sure. is needed for that particular mission. You think about the need to do things like defect tracking within software before it's released. And if you're trying to propagate that software update to a fleet of 1100 AI enabled unmanned systems that are in theater, mm -hmm. how can I track the defect? How can I track the severity of that defect? And then also assign a probability that that defect will manifest itself while it is in use. You can do all of that in you know, one central system and tie both upper ends of the V model um, to each other. So that's, that's critical for that. The second piece is uh, software code reuse within product families. If you have multiple variants, say, of an, back to the example of an unmanned system, you could have some that will have a kinetic capability, others that will have non-kinetic. Some of them are going to have an electro-optical infrared sensor, others are going to have a synthetic aperture radar. So you can see all the different variants that might happen just within one product family, 
how can I uh, reuse as much as possible, say 80% of common software code among all of them, and then just tweak the, the remaining 20%. Yeah, uh, we're talking about reuse. You know, software is, is an easy one to kind of think through, but we should also think through hardware reuse, right? Whether it's the mechanical components or electrical components, right? That together sure. with software, right? That's making up these complex you know systems that are needed out there today. Right. Well, another um, over the horizon use case we may see for digital engineering would be things like. Um, you know, back in, in one of the acquisition commands, you know, could you harmonize engineering and technical data uh, with logistician data into one data repository and just get a clearer picture of readiness at the Mark 45 uh, weapon system on the bow of this battleship should be damaged for whatever reason. How does that impact my readiness across a battle management group? or across an entire fleet as it is configuration managed in the field. So you can kind of see where I'm going, is that you're going from a lack of focus in readiness to a super sharpened version of readiness. Another piece might be, you think about uh, CENTCOM, for example, forward deployed austere locations with ground vehicles. If, a, if one ground vehicle should break down, the entire convoy has to stop. What if you could use three-dimensional CAD data, for example, to repurpose that to create an animated repair procedure for, say, repairing that uh, that carburetor of a broken Humvee, that's uh, that could be a critical capability that takes that downtime from two hours to 15 minutes, and that's that's a, a use of a digital engineering capability that has been around for say 15 and 20 years for a much new and needed capability in theater. I think it's interesting you brought those two examples. Um, the policy says digital engineering, right, mm -hmm. for the DOD. But if you read the policy and read it well, they make it crystal clear it's not just engineering, in maybe even manufacturing. It is truly about the sustainment mm -hmm. and maintaining, uh, you know, assets in the field. So I think it's a very good point that you make here um, with that. And, and we'll see more of this as we kind of go through the discussion today that it's really not just focused on engineering and there is a huge piece for sustainment. I know you and I have been talking about this in this, you know, if we think about what is digital engineering actually going to bring to the forefront, what is, you know, if you actually implement this appropriately, we believe that the outputs from digital engineering can be used for like higher order thinking. And this is where you can start bringing in, you know, like um, AI type of, of, right. of technology, right? You can take information that's in the authoritative source of truth, whether it's your ALM, your PLM, your ERP, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. that's like say the 50,000 foot level from a business perspective, right? When you're looking over functions and things of that nature. What if you could get to the 100,000 foot level and see overarching, right? Understand- the Entire enterprise. I exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, and maybe even taking some global inf inputs as well, right? right. They're happening uh, across the globe. Mm -hmm. What may happen to my supply chain that I'm reliant, on, reliant right. upon for getting product out the door? Can I predict where that those things may be happening? And sure. can I actually take action prior to some sort of catastrophic event or having a major supply chain issue? I think it's a huge, huge opportunity mm -hmm. uh, that digital engineering will bring to, to these companies. And then back to the margin compression question that everyone in the industry seems mm -hmm. to be talking about about is it's almost like if I'm able to produce three more launch vehicles for this firm fixed price contract in the next six months, this is going to be the impact on my P&L, my balance sheet, and my cash flows for the next seven quarters. So all of the directionality that is informed into that decision is really going to be influenced by what's happening at the product level. This is why digital engineering, I think, will be so important to higher order strategic decision making. Yeah, I'm glad we took a few minutes here in our, in our conversation before sure. we sort of dove into some details to go through those market conditions and understand, you know, why is it critically important, whether the policy exists or not, and what it can do right. actually do, um, you know, for the current running programs to make them more efficient, make them more profitable, but also, you know, what can it do in the future to help these companies actually get through those, mm -hmm. you know, trillion dollar backlogs. True. All right, so the capability elements themselves. Here yeah, we go. yeah, so uh, so the policy talks about four different capability elements. We'll, we'll go through all four of them here today. So the first one is, you know, digital ecosystem. Um, so if we sort of dive into the digital ecosystem, uh, you know, architect by training, by nature. Um, so if we take a quick look here and, and kind of digest what is being put forward by the DOD, they're talking about you need all the infrastructure, the software, mm -hmm. right? The training, right? And the workforce uh, associated to a digital engineering ecosystem. Uh, the big piece here is to talk about digital collaboration. Mm -hmm. We talked about it earlier, right? With collaboration need, being needed for these big global companies, right? That are, act, or multiple 
companies working together on these big global programs. Right. Whether it's government to government collaboration, government to contractor, contractor to subcontractor collaboration, it is key and it's, you know, they make it very crystal clear about, you know, the, the importance of this and why it's so important. So if we, uh, if we take a look, we have a perspective um, from, a, from a PTC perspective, if you will, on what would a reference architecture look like for the federal aerospace and defense mm -hmm. you know, community? Now, is this 100% complete? No, it, it's not meant to be. It is supposed to be a representation, a good starting point, right? That we can have a good conversation you know, with, with customers. If you look at the graphic itself, every place you see a green box is some, some place where PTC has a product, a solution, right? To complain in the space. You know, if we, when we thought about looking at what would an ecosystem look like, tried to break it down to five major components, systems engineering, as we see on the top, and then, you know, in the middle, hardware and soft, you know, hardware and electric, you know, which would be mechanical electrical engineering, sure. and then software engineering. Uh, but then you also have ops and supply chain, and then the aftermarket sustaining, as we, we've been talking about. There's no uh, sort of guessing here as to why I laid out the, the architecture the way I did. Mm -hmm. If you look in the upper right, upper left-hand corner, you'll see uh, requirements in our, in our product code beamer. Sure. And if you look over on the right-hand side, you get test cases and test traceability, right? Mm -hmm. So if we kind of, you can almost superimpose the systems V into this particular architecture, right? right? Going from that left-hand side of requirements decomposition through systems model, mm -hmm. through simulation, through you know, design development, you know, you know, detailed design, up through test and validation. I think it's important to actually take a pause and actually talk about ALM, because I think you know, our perspective on ALM, you know, people may have a different perce per perception on ALM. Mm -hmm. So just noting that we actually, we actually cover requirements through test and the traceability, as you mentioned before, and have templates for actually having, helping programs actually execute. If we you know, take a look at the systems engineering area before, uh, as we started to look at and, and think about a few minutes ago when, when I, kind of brought the entire reference architecture together uh, up on the screen. One of the key things here I want to make sure that was was clear, right, was the requirements, you know, connectivity to systems modeling, right? So again, PTC has a product for that, but also bringing in some of our key partners, such as ANSYS, for example, yeah. and making sure that the requirements information, the model information, right, can get to those simulation tools. Mm -hmm. And yes, multi-physics simulation is absolutely critical for these, you know, for these types of products that are being delivered, but early mission simulation, right, mm -hmm. and having that done so you can actually start to de risk your program. Talked about firm fixed price programs, risk associated with new tech development. Sure. This is a way of actually de-risking those programs so that uh, as the, the business development folks uh, you know, at these primes are starting to look at these contracts, mm -hmm. can actually understand whether or not where the risk you know, is and they can, uh, they can do something associated to that. Sure. If you look at the hardware in software areas, so you'll see a lot of the, the typical things, right? You'll see Winchell you know, as our PLM sort of backbone here. And we think that that is a huge piece of the digital engineering ecosystem. Uh, you know, management of uh, the electrical and the mechanical bills materials, that information. But I think the key piece that we want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about is as that information is coming in, we're thinking about, you know, again, some of our partners such as a priori starting to do design for X, whether it's its cost, its maintainability, or its you know sustainability, right? So making sure that we're bringing that in as early as possible, mm -hmm. so not waiting to the end where you're going to start uh, incurring significant changes. Now the key point, you know, on the software side, is that we know there's a lot of software tools out there, right? There's going to be lots of folks that are going to want their own software tool change, and, and that's okay mm -hmm. to have their software tool chains. I think looking at you know product line engineering as you mentioned before with with reuse, I think that's where you know pure variance would be you know is is a perfect fit for that, mm -hmm. uh, in helping uh, you know our customers actually figure out what parts are reuse and how they can build a bill of material right that's uh, managed towards towards a variant. Now that software, right, is such a critical piece of the products that are being designed and delivered today, just as critical as the hardware pieces, right? Yeah. So making sure that software bill material is actually tied together, you know, with that hardware piece in the PLM and things are being released as appropriate, it is absolutely vital that those two things get connected. And we see oftentimes right now is that they're two separate worlds and at some point in time later down the, the road, they're actually integrated. Yeah. But how are they integrated? How are they managed? How are the configuration managed and controlled is, is a key aspect of this. If we look at operations, um, you know, in supply chain, again, we know that you know we're going to have to uh, connect to ERP and MES systems mm -hmm. um, and get bills materials, whether it's an engineering bill material or you know, preferably a manufacturing bill material that we actually get to an ERP into an MES, as well as actually the digital model 
right, from the engineering community to the MES with the characteristics that can be then utilized on the factory floor, mm -hmm. right, for verification purposes. Um, when we look at other tools that we have in, uh, you know, in these particular areas, we have our IoT, our ThingWorks solution, mm -hmm. taking uh, information coming right off the factory floor uh, and making sure that the, the factory floor is running as efficient as possible. Again, going towards those fixed price, fixed price programs and making sure that we have absolute uh, efficiency in those uh, in those factories. How do you scale the factory to accommodate? I mean, I was looking at one win by Raytheon, I think recently in the Coyote program. There was 600 unmanned systems initially scaling to 6,000 by 2029. And how do you scale that? Yeah, I mean, again, that's that's where it's it's critical to look at your operations, right, and mm -hmm. find those bottlenecks uh, and and do this in a sort of a continuous uh, loop, if you will. Right, is to monitor to find those bottlenecks to re to remove the bottlenecks, right? Verify that you actually have removed them and you're speeding up your and getting the efficiencies you need. And then right back around again, making sure you're monitoring and, and doing that. So at this point, it really comes down to you know minutes and seconds, right? Is what is going to be able to provide uh, higher. Uh, volume outputs in these factories. True. Along with that, just making sure the quality is absolutely critical, right? That those products actually are built uh, with the appropriate quality mm -hmm. the first time and not in, during re rework. Uh, you know, again, we have capabilities such as Vuforia, right? To help um, the folks on the factory floor actually understand work instructions, right. make sure they pick the appropriate, you know, parts that need, place them appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, using IoT, if, if for example, if there's a specific torque that a, a nut or a bolt needs to get to, right. you know, we have the ability to actually set that, uh, set that torque value on a smart connected tool, mm -hmm. have that tool be used, and then actually uh, have the results recorded that it was actually appropriately, you know, uh, at the spec that it needed to be. True. Well, the other thing I was thinking about was our service lifecycle management story, which is especially strong in the U.S. Air Force, as one example, but also um, the majority of the world's airlines. And you think about that as just, if there's uh, an inclement weather uh, event, where do I forward deploy all of these spare parts in order to meet um, an incremental availability target that I didn't have yesterday, but I do have today? Or how could that uh, imply, uh, have an implication for the combatant commands? You can imagine the different scenarios there. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you look at it, right, that's where, you know, the engineering, if you go all the way back to engineering and you think about, you know, okay, we're doing an engineering bill of material, to a manufacturing bill material. I think you know most people you know kind of get that and understand the need to do that. But at the same time, you really should be thinking about service. Right. Right. What is the service bill material going to look like? And that should be feeding into systems that actually can start to understand inventory, where that inventory needs to be in order to make sure the parts are in the right place at the right time, as you mentioned. And again, just like on the factory floor, and you mentioned again, you know, uh, I think it was with Sencom uh, in your early example, right? Making sure you actually have the right instructions and how can I actually make sure that. Um, if some a repair is needed in the field, that that repair can be done as fast as possible to get out of harm's way and move on to the mission right. at hand. All right, so the next one here, let's talk digital models, digital twin. So again, won't read the, the instruction, folks can read the instruction, but sort of the high points to me that come out on the instructions around digital models, right? So this concept of digital model in simulation, again, has been around since 1994, mm -hmm. right? So it's a long time coming here. The piece that's interesting that I like about the policy, it talks about the, the models and making sure those models are actually utilized, you know, created, utilized, verified mm -hmm. prior to major milestones. Right, make sure that uh, the major stakeholders that are on those programs actually have access to, they're actually contributing towards the development of those models. Right, so I think it's, it's, uh, I think it's a, a move in the right direction. So we're not just using models to then derive paper, right? We're using models to actually drive business, right. to drive behaviors downstream. If we're thinking about, you know, what types of models are we talking about? You know, I kind of, I, again, try to overlay some of the different thoughts around models. Again, this isn't the com uh, comprehensive list of all types of models out there. You, you, you wouldn't have enough room on a page. But I attempted to just give a flavor in each one of those different areas of the reference architecture. If we start at the very top in systems engineering, we know there's gonna be requirements models, right? We know there's gonna be systems models, whether it be behavior models, uh, it could be integrations models, um, those types of things that you're going to actually find in in your systems and modeling areas, mm -hmm. but you're also going to see the the, si the simulation models and you see the simulation results actually coming out of those already out of those models. In hardware engineering, kind of the usual suspects as we think, you know, engineering builds materials. We'd have you know CAD 3D designs. I mentioned uh, characteristics, so now we're talking really true model based, uh, you know, design sure. and engineering and actually making sure the the characteristics 
um, are actually put into the models so they can be consumed downstream, uh, and so they can either inform factory operations or inform uh, quality operations, things of that nature. Uh, same thing is true in software. We'll see software models, right? You'll see the class designs. And in some cases, we actually you know, see code generation coming out of the systems models, mm -hmm. right, leading into that. And those class designs are, are critical to understand that, uh, how those, the software needs to be developed, sequence diagrams, things of that nature, and even soft, you know, software you know, modules themselves as you start to model that stuff out. I can't remember who in the tech industry was making the point a few weeks ago. If we want to put all of these thousands of unmanned systems into into Paycom in the next year and a half, um, that's not time enough to develop a new clean sheet design. So you're going to have to manufacture what you already have. The only place to innovate is in software. And I do think that's a remarkable point. I mean, there really is a highlight on bringing software innovation into the combatant commands. And again, that's software engineering is going to be the root of all of that. Yeah, if, you, if we actually stop for a second and kind of think that through, right, what enables that? Modularity, openness, right, to be able to actually be able to plug and play new software, and in some cases, new hardware, right? So you mentioned it before, you know, as we were discussing sort of the market conditions with the DOD, mm -hmm. the need for module open systems architecture sure. and the weapons open systems architecture. You know, if you go back and look at our reference architecture, right, now I've kind of failed to say this, and hopefully people saw that, right? Mm -hmm. We're not expecting to go into, uh, you know, to a customer and they're going to take one of everything that we have. We know there's going to be other tools in the ecosystem. That is okay. We can, we can wrap, extend, we can plug and play, mm -hmm. right? We ourselves have taken a modular open systems architecture approach to every single product that we produce here. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's important to know that the ecosystem doesn't have to look like what I've described, right? We, let's just take a look piece by piece and yeah. we can work through all that. We don't aspire to be the single source of truth. We aspire to be one of several authoritative sources of truth. Absolutely. And the ability to actually string those together to put those together, which we'll talk about here in a minute with the digital thread. Right. Again, uh, DoD actually has their kind of thought process on the digital thread. And if I just, you know, kind of step back and say, okay, what is a digital thread good for? It's great that I have things connected. Right. Right. The, the goodness actually comes from, can I actually utilize that data? Can I utilize data from multiple systems to give me business insights that I didn't have yesterday? Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's that type of thinking. And I think that's to me what the, digi the power of the digital thread is all about. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, it, the, the hard questions are really answered at the intersections of multiple business systems. Sure. Right. And I think that's a key point for, for people to understand. Yeah, so this constant analogy that we've been using inside the, the company and, and externally as well, you know, a tree's beauty lies in its fruit, but its strength lies in its roots. And we're using that as a metaphor for digital engineering that we're trying to take across the entire system's life cycle from initial requirements in the upper edge of the V model um, down through a system's architecture uh, down to detailed design when we're getting into just the extreme nuts and bolts of, of how these products are going to be um, designed to uh, verification and validation, um, ultimately to, uh, to a testing regime. So you're essentially tying a requirements capability to a testing capability and then having a bidirectionality in the digital models in between all of those, in addition yeah. to operations and sustainment. Yeah, I really, really like this view because again, I showed the digital ecosystem, how things are connected, you know, big major systems, tools, ALMs, PLMs, ERPs, MESs, uh, you know, things in aftermarket sustaining. But this actually shows what are the elements inside those particular authoritative sources of truth? How do they connect together? Mm -hmm. What does a digital thread really look like? Why is it important, right? It's important right. to have that requirement trace you know, uh, in your designs, whether it's your early designs with systems, in, you know, systems engineering practices, mm -hmm. your detailed design, or on the factory floor and actually trying to understand what, what is happening, make sure the quality is, is absolute. Uh, it is absolutely critical that that traceability exists because the cost associated with rework mm -hmm. or for something not actually meeting a mission, you know, before it's actually shipped off the dock, right, yep. is so expensive. And again, we, we tie that back to firm fixed price programs, right? Those, those market conditions, right, with the huge backlogs, right, in being able to try to get these, these products out the door. Absolutely true. So digital artifacts, yeah. So the piece that jumps off the screen for me in, in the language here is that it, 
the artifacts that the DOD is expecting to be um, delivered by the primes for these programs, right, should be produced by the authoritative sources of truth, right? It should be, that's how they should be generated. And they need to be generated dynamically. Mm -hmm. So today we see that often and even days in the past, right? You know, getting up to a major delivery, whether it's, you know, it's a preliminary design review or right. critical design review, sure. people are frantically, you know, creating drawings by hand or- They're quite chaotic. <laughs> the lead up, especially to those design no, reviews. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, whether it's actually filling out spreadsheets mm -hmm. or actually PowerPoint presentations of different aspects of the design to yeah. try to convey, you know, where the program is at with, you know, with this design and, and give the customer a sense of confidence that the, the you know, the contractor's on the right path. Yep. So these artifacts we're talking about, right? And if we, if we start thinking about those artifacts, those, we should be having those models, right? Those are the conversation mm -hmm. pieces that we need to be having, you know, with a customer. Right at those critical design reviews or preliminary design review, whichever it happens to be at those milestones, right? True. So, you know, again, talked about those artifacts, whether it's requirements, simulation results, test cases, test results, right? Mm -hmm. Engineering bills and materials, manufacturing bills and materials. Um, even if you think about some of the areas, in, in, oftentimes aftermarket sustaining sort of an, you know, people kind of an afterthought from an engineering perspective, but hang on a second, there's a huge chunk of the cost of the life cycle of a program yeah. in the sustainment aspect of this. So what is the actual cost, the estimates for those parts to actually support that thing in the field for how many years that, yeah. that may be in there? So it's critically important that those types of things are able to be generated with confidence, mm -hmm. right? And we're not back of a napkin, you know, estimating these types of items. And there's no real shelf life for those artifacts either. I mean, you could have CAD data and the example that I was using on ground vehicles, hypothetically, <laughs> that you could repurpose for an entirely new use case. And if you own the intellectual property, you still own it. 15 years from now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, we, we know there's technical publications that support manufacturing and aftermarket, right? So yeah. along with the illustrations that go with it, it's, it's a huge thing. All right, Danny. So now what? What do we do about this? Well, I, I think we've given folks maybe, hopefully some good information on why to act, right. you know, act now uh, type of thing. And, and, and that should be the takeaway that hopefully folks are gonna get from this. Mm -hmm. And it's not, be, again, because the DOD has issued a policy and thou shalt go do something now. They've been recommending something since 1994. Right. They outlined a strategy on what it should look like, how it should be moving forward. Yes, now we have an instruction, but it's good practice to go down the, the you know, to get into digital engineering, do it correctly for right. all the market conditions we've discussed at the moment. Right, well, so one point would be this idea of just skyrocketing complexity. You know, again, with the idea of unmanned systems capabilities and everyone seems to be developing them. Just because an unmanned system is attritable doesn't mean it's not complex. In fact, back to the uh, product family question and all the variants within a product family and then stamping out different iterations of products on, on down the line, I do think that you know, there is no silver bullet answer to anything. There's no easy answers in any of this, but I do think that a structured and disciplined strategic approach around digital engineering is one way to chip away at the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one, one piece. And then the firm fixed price uh, issue that continues to, uh, to be remaining. Um, if you're not able to renegotiate a, a contract with an end government customer, as many of the large defense contractors are, are trying to do, then if you're, if you're stuck in, in delivery mode with all of that, how do you optimize? How do you optimize designs? How do you optimize manufacturing, uh, particularly with an IoT capability? We're seeing many of our customers actually using IoT for sustainment functions. And there's a demand signal out there in government and also in industry in order to do that in the national security enterprise. And then the last piece is, think about foreign military sales, you know, the global implications of a DOD policy and I think um, you know there's going to be many foreign governments that are going to be adopting their own digital engineering strategies, at least partly based on what the, the Pentagon has decided to do. Well, we we saw it earlier, and we talked about it earlier when we talked about the you know these big programs, right, where multiple countries are coming together, mm -hmm. right. So they're going to have to sort of think about what is their digital engineering practice, how are they actually going to collaborate with each other, how they exchange data, how they're going to yeah. package everything up right, for a deliverable and making sure that actually each other can consume these things. 
whether manufacturing is done, you know, at your facility or at some other country's facility, right? Sure. Being able to make sure those models go there with the characteristics, as I mentioned before, is, right. is critical. So, ideas for <clears throat> action. Well, hopefully folks have seen in, in kind of through our discussion here with the reference architecture, we have put some thought into this, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the point we should, you know, hopefully folks are getting is that we have a perspective, we can help, and they should ask for help. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has, has to go off and build their own reference architecture or digital ecosystem. Sure. We can utilize the one we just displayed, go in and help a customer actually overlay what do they have in their ecosystem today? What are they aspiring to tomorrow? Where are their, where are their issues and they want to get to? and start you know, building a roadmap towards helping them mm -hmm. uh, achieve the digital engineering uh, pieces that are necess uh, necessary. No, that's definitely true. And, and then the other piece we're seeing is just building out internal awareness. You have to think that there's uh, many people in, in the digital engineering proper community in many of the defense contractors that have been focused on this for years and years, but perhaps there's another group that's in capture management or business development that may not have as much contact or exposure to this. Mm -hmm. And if they're looking to gain situational fluency with that, PTC may, may be a resource to help them. Yeah, absolutely. We, we heard it again this morning in one of our meetings we're in, right? Uh, digital transformation seems to be a full contact sport these days. <laughs> and what I mean by that is it, put it. It, it takes you know, everybody within the organization, right? From the CEO all the way down to you know, the, the people on the factory floor or the engineers themselves, right? Mm -hmm. To be on board and making sure that they're going down the right path uh, so that they actually can implement the right things, move the needle for their company in the direction they need to move it in. Mm -hmm. And then long range digital engineering planning at a high level, I mean, we can always be a resource for anyone who's looking to you know, build out their own digital en engineering ecosystem. As Danny said, you know, we realize that each digital engineering ecosystem is going to be different and we're, we're fine with that. We have 30,000 customers globally and not one of them is, is using every single one of our products and, and that's how we wish it to be. Yeah, if, if we, again, if you think about a kind of a customer engagement with, you know, with the, with the planning aspect, right, it, I think it's critical that we go in and understand, you know, what is in their ecosystem today and, you know, how would things sort of, um, you know, kind of overlay. I, I can't emphasize enough, we've put some thought into this thing, mm -hmm. um, into this reference architecture. Each one of those boxes requires a double click, which we'll continue to develop over time here. And even those will require double clicks as we get into. Just want folks to know that we, we are thinking about not only the big boxes and where do they fit within the ecosystem, right. but what actually data that needs to be connected. How does that data connect? What is the meaningfulness of that data? What's the, what is the, the fruits, if you will, mm -hmm. to your point, uh, on connecting that data together? True. So whether it's digital ecosystems for collaboration, digital models for traceability, digital threads for analytics, or digital artifacts created from those models, PTC has a unique point of view to help simplify the on-ramp to this new mandated reality. Thanks again for tuning in today. This session has been recorded and we will be posting it online. If you're a stakeholder in government or an industry looking to optimize your pathway to adopting 5097, please send us a note or hit us up on LinkedIn. Thank you.